The superman has become the subhuman man. The one who would not perceive God's glory now cannot perceive God's glory because just as a blind man cannot appreciate a sunset and a deaf man cannot appreciate a symphony, so also can an ox not appreciate the glory of God. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you. And here it is for the third time until you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and he ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So here's the pronouncement and this comes to pass. Nebuchadnezzar is driven from among men, which was what would have happened to insane people that day. They didn't, they didn't have asylums. And so insane people, you remember like in Mark 5, the man that was possessed by the demons known as Legion, how he had to live away from people. That's how insane people had to live their life in those days. And so he was driven from among men. He was given the mind of a beast, of an ox. He eats grass. His body's wet with the dew of heaven, meaning that he lives in the the outdoors all the time. His hair grows long. His nails are like bird's claws, etc., etc. So this seems to describe something called lycanthropy. Lycanthropy, which I'm probably mispronouncing, lycanthropy is a, an actual mental condition in which the patient believes themselves to be an animal and then acts like the animal. Lycanthropy, the, the name literally, the word literally means wolf man, and it's actually the, the true mental condition that's behind all the superstitious, fictional werewolf stories. Because the, the word literally means wolf man. But it, it doesn't have to be that one imagines himself as a wolf. You can imagine yourself as all kinds of animals. Now, this is very different from a different kind of sickness that we see today. There's a very different sort of illness today in which people are taking the identity of an animal. That's a different kind of sickness altogether. This is where a person truly believes themselves to be an animal and then acts in such a way. There's an interesting case in 1946, a well-documented case of lycanthropy that was seemingly just like Nebuchadnezzar's in which a British man believed himself to be an ox and ate grass and lived outside and that sort of thing. And interestingly, in that case, it's well documented that the two physical effects that the doctors observed from this patient was one, of course, the lengthening and the coarsening of the hair. And we can kind of imagine that from somebody who lives outside. But, but secondly, the nails grew thick like claw-type nails. So so interesting sort of a confirmation, I think, of what happens to Nebuchadnezzar here. But it's also interesting how appropriate is Nebuchadnezzar's judgment upon him. So here's a man who exalts himself to the highest levels and says, it's all about me, 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 me. Every brick is about me. And God says, well, let's take the exalted one and let's put them as the lowest one. Let's give them the mind of the beast. You think that all the the creatures in your kingdom are provided for by your greatness? Well, let me make you one of those creatures in which you have to be provided for literally by the grass that I make to grow. You see how appropriate is God's judgment upon him. The superman has become the subhuman man. The one who would not perceive God's glory now cannot perceive God's glory because just as a blind man cannot appreciate a sunset and a deaf man cannot appreciate a symphony, so also can an ox not appreciate the glory of God. Now verse 34, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. So after this seven periods of time, probably seven years, after this period of time, Nebuchadnezzar still has enough wherewithal to, as he says, lift his eyes to heaven, which is a metaphoric way of saying he recognizes the sovereignty of God over his life. He recognizes that he is where he is. He's, this has happened to him all because of the sovereign 
judgment of God. And doing that, he is then, he experiences this restoration. Restoration of mind, restoration of his faculties, and he praises and honors God who lives forever. Now, notice here the contrast between the mercy of God and the non-mercy of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar throughout the story has been pictured to us as a man without mercy. In chapter 1, he has no mercy on the magicians who can't tell him his dream. He just says, kill them all. In chapter 3, he has no mercy to those who won't bow to the statue that's him. And he throws them in a burning furnace. And even then, when they come out of the furnace unharmed, Nebuchadnezzar declares, well, anybody who says anything against their God, I'm going to tear them limb from limb and, tear, and burn their house down. He is a man without mercy. And yet he's shown such great mercy from God. Look at the mercy of God. How Nebuchadnezzar had simply to make the slightest recognition and affirmation of the sovereignty of God. And God was willing to restore Nebuchadnezzar. The patient, long-suffering, merciful God is contrasted against the unmerciful Nebuchadnezzar. Now, it's worth noting that the beginning of the story and the end of the story, there's a contrast there between where Nebuchadnezzar's looking. At the beginning, he's looking down at his city of Babylon. And then as his restoration comes, he's looking up to heaven. But let's continue in verse 34. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors... And my lords sought me. So Nebuchadnezzar didn't come back into Babylon and ask to be put back into power. They sought him out. My lords and my counselors sought me and I was established in my kingdom and I, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king, king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So Nebuchadnezzar's turning point has averted God's judgment. But let's not be fooled here. There is no repentance. There is no faith. We are saved by faith and repentance, neither of which Nebuchadnezzar has. We are not saved by recognizing the sovereignty of God. Recognizing the sovereignty of God is the first step, so to speak, to salvation. Because we cannot be saved without, of course, recognizing the sovereignty of God. But recognizing that God is sovereign saves no one, if that's as far as it goes. And that's as far as it went for Nebuchadnezzar. Repentance is the element that is obviously missing from Nebuchadnezzar's words here. In fact, what seems to me to be taking place in Nebuchadnezzar's restoration is look at all the personal pronouns. My majesty, my kingdom, my glory. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar says that he was made even more great. More greatness was added to me. In other words, all the same pride is still there. Nebuchadnezzar's pride has not been averted one bit. The only thing that's different is Nebuchadnezzar now glosses over his pride with this thin veneer of praising God, of recognizing that, that the blessings are from God, but he still has self in the center. He's still just as prideful as he was before. He's just now sort of putting on some airs to it that recognize God. He's sort of like throwing God a bone. Talking about his own greatness and his own kingdom and his own glory. Oh yeah, God gave this to me. We know people like that, don't we? That that are still absorbed with themselves and all about themselves. And they'll sort of throw some recognition God's way. Yeah, God's, God's done great things for me. But let's talk about me some more. Don't you know people like that? that the blessings of God are really just an avenue for them to still praise themselves and talk about how much God has done for them. Now, they're talking about God, but at the end of the day, they're still talking about themselves. That's still pride. Well, let's notice a couple of things here as we wrap up. Number one, let's notice the message for Israel because this was, of course, written to Israel. So what was the message to Israel? The message to Israel was a message of hope because Israel was the tree. Nebuchadnezzar obviously is the tree, but in another sense, Israel is that tree of pride. 
And Israel has been lopped off and chopped down just like Nebuchadnezzar. But just like Nebuchadnezzar, there remains a stump. And that stump holds out hope. And the hope is that you, Israel, if you repent and if you turn, then just like Nebuchadnezzar, God can show you patience and mercy and extreme forbearance. This is a great message of hope for the exiled people. Like the words of the chronicler in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. The experience of Nebuchadnezzar was given in the book of Daniel to God's people as a way of holding out hope to them. There is always hope. There is always hope. You can always turn You are never too far down the path of disobedience. You can always turn and God will be there waiting for you. So that's one message that we see. But I think the greater message is this. I think the greater message is the humbling message of the gospel. The humbling message of the gospel. Because you see, as we said a little bit earlier, because you see, as we just said, the first step, so to speak, in knowing God is recognizing that you're not. That's what Jesus means when He says, I am. He means I am and you're not. And that's sort of the first step, is recognizing He has authority over all aspects of my life. And all of the human aspects of my life, all of them are liabilities before Him. Because you see, we stand before God with a problem, a great problem. And that problem is not just our weaknesses and failures. But our problem is also, to the same extent, our successes and our strengths. Because both of them give fertile ground to pride. Our weaknesses give fertile ground to pride just as much as our strengths. And so we stand before God in desperate need of being freed from ourself. We don't stand before God saying, oh God, I'm, I'm just this humble person. I'm just this lowly person. I think lowly of myself. I never exalt myself. And so therefore, I have a certain standing before you. No, you don't. We stand before God with no standing. We stand before God in need of Him to give us a new heart. The humbling of man's pride, that is, that is some of the most difficult messages of Scripture. The message of Scripture that says you are the problem. Not your failures, not your weaknesses, you. That's the humbling message of Scripture. But what a glorious message it is. The only way for us to enter God's kingdom is with empty hands. The only way for us to empty God's kingdom is to simply come to Him as one who brings nothing. Do you want to know the worst thing that God can do to you? You ever feel like God is unfair? You ever feel like God hasn't treated you well? You ever feel like that God has wronged you? Okay, we, we all can have times in which we struggle with those feelings, right? But you want to know the worst thing that God can do for you? the worst thing that God can ever do for you is to leave you comfortable and at ease with your pride. The worst thing that can happen to you is for God to leave you comfortable and easy in your pride. Think of the story of the prodigal son. Just imagine if that story had gone differently. Just imagine if the prodigal had gone to the land of the Gentiles and not wasted all of his father's money and not found himself feeding the pigs and wishing that he could eat their food. Just imagine if he arrived in the land of the Gentiles and used his father's money wisely and established a profitable business. And now people work for him instead of the other way around. That would have been the worst thing that God could have allowed to happen. But the most merciful thing was God troubling the waters of his life. 
and troubling them to the point that he found himself at the end of himself. That he found himself at the lowest possible point in which he could finally look at himself straight and say, you are the problem. And God is the solution. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Truth That Transforms with pastor and Bible teacher Jason Wilkerson. Truth That Transforms is the daily teaching broadcast of Disciples Fellowship Church. We invite you to visit our website where you will find more resources to help in your journey of discipleship. You can find us at www.disciplesfellowshipnc.com or connect with our Facebook page at Facebook slash Disciples Fellowship NC. Truth That Transforms exists to glorify Jesus Christ through the teaching of His sanctifying and disciple-making Word.